Good morning, everybody. Hello to everyone who's watching us online. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Hey, Josh. Good to see you. We went to high school together. It's fun to see him. It's Epiphany. What does Epiphany mean? Revealed, right? It, it's like showing you something, something that is extraordinary, out of the ordinary that is being revealed to you. Uh, here's another way to think of it. Epiphany is like asking the question, what kind of blank is that? You ask that question when it's something that's out of the ordinary. For example, you go to a New Year's Eve party. There's a cheese platter. You grab some cheese, you eat it. It's ordinary cheese. You're not asking, now what kind of cheese is that? Because it's ordinary cheese. Well, you take a bite of cheese that is like, mmm, fantastic. You're like, oh, that is extraordinary cheese. What kind of cheese is that? Right? When it's something that is out of the ordinary, that is just wow, that you're asking, what is that? Reveal it to me. Let me have an epiphany. The thing about extraordinary is sometimes the out of the ordinary is not always a good thing. You can also take a bite of cheese and go, what kind of cheese is that? <laughs> it's not ordinary, and it's in the bad sense. You can have an epiphany that's a negative epiphany. We are in the season of Epiphany. It's after Christmas. It's before Lent. It's that time when we look at what kind of God is that. Looking at Jesus and going, what kind of God is that? He is an extraordinary God. Look at what he is. Look at what he's done. And, and we look at like the wedding at Cana. It's like, wow, this is a God who does miracles and who loves people. And then you look at Jesus' baptism. It's like, wow, this is a God who is a part of the Trinity, who gives honor, and the Father is proud of him. Okay, wow, th what kind of God is this? It's transfiguration where Jesus goes up on the mountain and is, whoa, in his full glory. Wow, what kind of God is that? The one we're looking at today is revealing Jesus to us in a way that, mm, I think a lot of people would see more as extraordinary in the negative sense. It gives people a lot of questions. It gave Mary a lot of questions. But as we examine this revealing of Jesus to us today, what we will walk away with is an appreciation and a wow at the epiphany of the kind of God that Jesus is. And so we'll do that using Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. We'll read through the whole account. This is the only gospel that has this account. There's four gospels or biographies of Jesus. This is the only one that talks about this story, which is kind of interesting. Verse 41. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he, Jesus, was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they, did, when they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Of course they were. <laughs> when his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured up all these things in her heart and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. What kind of God is that? Jesus, true God, true man. God. What kind of God is that who would do such a thing to his mother? Uh, show of hands here, parents. Raise your hand nice and high. Okay, let's see where the parents are. Come on, you're here. Show them. Okay. Put your hands down. Raise your hand if you ever lost your kid. <laughs> yep, I've, I've done it right out here. Um, 
just doing some yard work. Bennett was out in the front with me. He was right there. You know, I think I was filling up the tires. Amanda comes out. Hey, where's Bennett? I'm like, he's right around here somewhere. <laughs> Maybe in the creek. <laughs> I mean, he had, he had gone up like the side of the parking lot. And in that just brief moment of losing my child, oh, <laughs> the worst feeling in the world. Mary and Joseph lost their child for three days. Three days. Oh, and what kind of a child is this? It's no ordinary child. Mary, you lost God's son. And like, you, you got to ask the question, like, how is this possible that he could be gone? Like, remember, they, they came from Nazareth down to Jerusalem for the Passover. There were three festivals that the Israelites were encouraged to make a pilgrimage back to Jerusalem. Uh, for Mary and Joseph, it was their tradition that every year they would go to Jerusalem for the Passover. You guys remember the Passover. It's the remembrance meal of when the Israelites were in Egypt and God was sending the angel of death to take every firstborn son. And God said, kill a lamb, paint the blood on the doorways. Every doorway that has the blood on it, the angel of death will pass over. And in that way, God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt and brought them into deliverance. Okay, remembering that, they would do the Passover meal. And they would go and they would eat the lamb and there would, they would get rid of the leaven. And so Mary and Joseph came down with Jesus. He's 12 years old. They do the Passover in Jerusalem and now it's time to go. And Mary and Joseph leave without their 12-year-old son. How is that even possible? Actually, I thought it was kind of interesting. One commentator said that normally when people would do these pilgrimages, they would go in groups, you know, big groups of people, which makes sense. There's safety in numbers. So a big group of people coming down from Nazareth to Jerusalem. They celebrate the Passover. Now a big group of people travel back up. Here's the kicker. Normally, the men would stay in the back of the group to make sure that no one would attack them from behind, and then the women and the children would be in the front of the group. Now, this is where it makes sense. How old is Jesus? Twelve years old. What happens at age 13 in the Jewish culture? For young boys, they have their bar mitzvah, or the son of the law. They become men. And so the year before Jesus is about to become a man in the Jewish culture, he should be with Joseph learning what it looks like to be a man. And Joseph figures he's not a man yet. He should be with Mary and the kids in the front of the group. So as they're traveling along, Mary thinks Jesus is with Joseph. Joseph thinks Jesus is with Mary. They get to where they're going on day one and they go, where's Jesus? Where's the son of God? <laughs> Yikes. So they go back, right? They have to travel back to Jerusalem, and then they're looking for him and looking for him and looking for him and looking for him. A whole day, like after three days of looking for your kid, you know, at what point do you give up and just go, he must be dead? You know, did somebody hear that he might be the son of God? That would make him very valuable. What if somebody captured him? All the things that must have been going through their head and they finally find him. They find him in the temple courts and they're amazed at Jesus' questions and answers and, and they're, the teachers are explaining things and he's grasping it and he's asking for more understanding. People are just amazed and Mary comes in. What kind of a God do you think you are? <laughs> Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you for three days. It's an interesting word, anxious, in the Greek. Anxiously searching for you. That same word is only used three times in the New Testament. It's used here, the feeling that Mary has when she's separated from Jesus. It's used in Acts as Paul is about to leave the Ephesian Christians and they are feeling anxious because Paul said, I will never see you again. 
as he knew he was about to be arrested and sent to Jerusalem or sent to Rome. So as they knew that they were about to be separated from Paul, they felt anxious. You want us the third time? The rich man and poor Lazarus. And the rich man said that he is there. He's just wishing for a dip of water on his tongue as he's in hell because he is in this anguish, in this agony, in hell, which is separation from God. This anxiousness that Mary feels is the anxiousness that we get when we are separated, either physically or separated by death or separated from God eternally. I think that's interesting. So Mary says, we have been anxiously searching you because we have been separated from you. And you got to ask, like it, it does beg the question, like what kind of a God is that? Because I thought Jesus was supposed to be perfect. Well, he is perfect. The Bible says he is. But the Bible also, we heard it in the first reading today, the Bible says, honor your father and mother, right? Respect them. Don't disobey them. And for Jesus to go wandering off away from his parents seems like a pretty sinful thing for Jesus to do. That's where Jesus' answer is really important here. What does he say? Now, we have been anxiously searching for you. We've been separated from you. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. What Jesus is saying, the 12-year-old Jesus is saying, not that he left them. Really, what Jesus is saying is, why did you leave without me? Why did you leave without me? You knew where I was. You knew where I had to be. Think about what time of year it was. What were they celebrating? The Passover, which is a remembrance of what? The sacrifice that brings redemption. How is it possible that Mary and Joseph could be there with the Son of God, the promised Messiah, celebrating the Passover, which is a remembrance meal, looking back at the deliverance God gave and looking forward to the deliverance that God was going to bring through the Messiah. And they have him right there at the temple where they do sacrifices, bringing union between God and his people. Again, all pointing to the Messiah. How is it possible that Mary and Joseph could be there with Jesus and yet leave him there and go without him? Have you ever asked God, what kind of a God are you who could leave me so alone? What kind of a God are you who could abandon me? I've thought that. What kind of a God allows the terrible things to happen in this world? What kind of a God allows the horrible temptations to bother us and the people that we love? What kind of a God allows financial struggles, health struggles? What kind of a God allows the church to be attacked in this kind of a way? What kind of a God is that? And we feel the anxiousness because we feel separated from God. But maybe the question needs to be asked, that we should be asking is, not what kind of a God is that who abandons me? Maybe the question is, why did I leave without God? Moses understood that. Did you know that at one point as the Israelites were wandering in the desert, God said to Moses, that's it, I'm done. I'm leaving you guys, I'll bless you, I will let you, you guys can go into your new kingdom, you guys, I'll give you the promised land, I'll let you defeat everyone, but I am not going with you, I'm done. And you know what Moses said? You could promise us all the blessings in the world, all the wealth in the world, but we will not go unless if you go with us. Without God with you, then there's no point in going in life. And what will happen is you may forget to take him with you, kind of like Mary and Joseph did. And so what kind of a God is it who lets us feel that anxiousness? Well, maybe that's what brings us back to God and go, oh, yeah, let's remember to take God with us. It brought Mary and Joseph back to the temple. 
brought Mary and Joseph back to God's word, brought Mary and Joseph back to the Savior to go, oh yeah, let's remember to take this one with us. Probably a good lesson for us. Can I just talk to the men for a little bit? Gentlemen, isn't it interesting the role that Joseph plays in this story? The non-existent one? I, I, you know, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. He's not really my kid. God's told me to watch over him. I'm, I'm worried about getting the car packed, making sure the, the robbers aren't attacking everyone. We made it down here. Okay, we got everyone a place to stay. Okay, good. Finally, we did the, the Passover meal. Everyone, we got, we got the food. We got the meal. Great. And now we're heading back, packed everything. Good. Okay, let's go. I can finally just hang out with the buddies a little bit. <laughs> Relax. And now, oh no, Joe, <laughs> Jesus isn't here. That's, that's my kid. That's a person I'm supposed to be responsible for. That's embarrassing. That's dishonorable. That's shameful. To look for him, look him, finally you see him, you see, you're feeling so ashamed that you haven't been doing what you're supposed to be doing, fulfilling your role, that you're not even going to be the one to talk in that situation. Like Mary's the one who's doing all the talking. Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. It's interesting, isn't it? What is the role of men that God has given to them to glorify God in everything that you do. That's what God wants you to do. And so that means glorifying God in the way that you're a husband to your wife. It means glorifying God by the way that you're a father to your children, not just providing a roof and a bed and food. That's important, but most importantly, teaching them and training them about God's word which is what he should have been doing with Jesus, teaching him how to be a man, teaching him to know about God's will. And when you fail at that, do you know what men tend to do? Become apathetic. Do you know what that word means, apathy? It means you just kind of give up. You shrink away. You hide. You just kind of don't care, whatever, right? It's not fulfilling your role, but it's just becoming neutral. That's what apathy is. That's what Joseph did here. Here's what I find very interesting. He totally bombed as a father to the Son of God. And yet, when Mary and Joseph come and find Jesus, and he says, you know, I was supposed to be here, and they're like, they don't even understand what that means. What does the Son of God do? He went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. When Joseph failed in his role as father and he became apathetic, it was God who placed him back into his position of authority, into his role. God went back under Joseph's authority. I think that's just an interesting note. When men mess up, and we mess up, and it's very tempting to just be so ashamed and to just cower into yourselves and become apathetic, know that it is God who forgives you and places you back into your position of authority to glorify God in the way that you're a husband and a father. Interesting. Last note, what kind of a God is that? A God who lets his parents feel this anxiousness? Well, they left him. <laughs> So it's a God who wanted them to come back and bring them with. We can appreciate that. When we forget God, <laughs> God lets us feel anxious so that we come back and go, okay, no, we need to remember to take Jesus with us. Um, what kind of a God is that? A God who, even though we fail in all role, our roles, puts us back into our positions, right? He forgives us and wants us to continue glorifying him. Third one, what kind of a God is that? You know what's the biggest problem with this story? a true story. If you believe that Jesus is God, and we do, we believe Jesus is God, a lot of people mock us because of this story. Why? 
the very last line. Verse 52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. Jesus grew. He increased. If Jesus is God, who is the all-knowing one? God. And you're saying Jesus is God? Yeah. But how can he increase in knowledge and wisdom and stature if he is the all-knowing God? Clearly, Jesus is not God. It's a very good argument, and I hope you don't walk away here going, oh, you're right, Jesus can't be God. No, no, he is. It's true, Jesus is the all-knowing one. Jesus is God. God knows all things, but it's also true that Jesus grew in wisdom. How can that be possible? For God to know all things and to still grow. Hmm. Well, actually, it's impossible. Unless if... God wanted to. How is it possible that God can know all things and still grow in wisdom? I don't know. But could God do that? Yeah. Yeah, he could. (laughs) So maybe the better question is to ask, why? Why would God, who knows all things, willingly not know all things? and have to grow in wisdom and stature and understanding to grow by going to the temple and learning from the teachers and asking questions. Why would God want to do that? How humiliating. Mm. To be the sacrifice. To be the sacrifice that takes away our sin. To be the sacrifice that delivers us from slavery to sin. The very reason why they are celebrating the Passover, that our God became truly human, was born, had to grow, had to learn, like all humans do, so that he could be a sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. What kind of God is that who has to grow in wisdom? Mm. The more you think about it, the more you realize that's a God who loves me. That's a God who saves me. And that's the best kind of God there is. What an extraordinary God we have. Amen.